welcome back uh, to this second part of this brief little series on an inspector calls by JB. First Priestley. slide, I just want to mention the staging and, and stage directions in an inspector calls. Priestley really uses bold and detailed stage directions to emphasize his bold moralistic message. The play is set in the fictional town of Brumley in the room in one room of a fairly large suburban house belonging to a fairly prosperous manufacturer. Priestley uses a lot of detailed stage directions. For example, he says before Act 1, producers who wish to avoid tricky business, which involves two resettings of a scene and very accurate adjustments, uh, would be well advised to dispense with an ordinary realistic set, etc., etc. So for every act, and in every scene, there are lots of little stage directions, lots of little instructions for how the actor should behave, smiling, half serious, half playful, in order to create the correct uh, mood for the audience, in order to deliver the play in the most powerful way possible. As I said previously in the prior talk, part one, it is set in 1912, shortly before the First World War, and Inspector Coles was a powerful message to that post-war audience still shocked by the Second World War. So every little detail, all the minutiae of the, of the scenes and the, and the acts are carefully planned in order to deliver his message. Now let's... Some of the main themes of this play. Uh, firstly, let's take a look at time. So according to the British Library, um, a British Library article that I've read, Priestley was preoccupied with time and circularity. So... In the play, there is an element of this, that we start with an inspector and the Burling family, and we go through the details of an investigation, the inspector leaves, and then near the end of the play, we see that the phone rings and another inspector calls. So there could be a repetition or the Burling family may change the course of their events, of their life, who knows? But there we can see the repetition that Priestley was interested in. Now, that I found in my research that Priestley also is very fascinated by different philosophers and famous persons of the Victorian time. One of them was P.D. Uspensky, who was a, a Russian mystic, um, who was an esoteric character, not easily understood, I think, um, and I certainly don't know much about him. He believed that all life events are theoretically repeatable. And the top quote on the right-hand side is accredited to him. He said, Generally speaking, the significance of the indirect results may very often be of more importance than the significance of direct ones. And I saw this and I thought this very much applies to an inspector calls. We can see that it's almost like a, a Sherlockian quote, you know, Sherlock Holmes and this idea that little things may affect other things, causality. And below that is a quote from J.W. Dunn, who suggested that we can see forward in time through our dreams. He was more of a contemporary of Priestley in the sense that he was also British, an aeronautical engineer, philosopher, with other interests. He said, where all is fog, a blind man with a stick is not entirely at a disadvantage. So in this play by Priestley and Inspector Calls, we do feel as an audience that for a large majority of the play, we are in a fog with the characters. So I thought there's very interesting elements here from these different influences in Priestley's life seen in the theme of time in the play. The main theme of an Inspector Calls, I would say, is social responsibility. Like the Burlings, us as a present day audience must come face to face with mistakes of our culture, our personal past or our collective past. And maybe we can choose to act differently to create a better world with hope. There is an emphasis on personal choice and opportunity. At the end of the play, the Burling family have this opportunity when the perhaps real inspector calls to be honest and own up, take ownership of their actions in order to progress, in order to be better people. The play connects to wider ideas. So the bottom picture on the right shows a mural by Banksy. You can see that interaction between the real man on the bench, this sort of 
uh, shameful thing which exists in our life, homelessness. Um, but there's that hope, that kind of fantastical element in the background. And I see that in Priestley's play with, with the Inspector Ghoul and this kind of mysticism that perhaps there's still hope. Or in the top right picture, we can see the different faces of Black Lives Matter, Black Children Matter, Black Lives Matter, Black Futures Matter. In the play, an inspector calls the, the woman who dies. She has different names because she plays different people in, in the characters' lives. She's a prostitute called Daisy Renton, but she's also another person called Eva Smith. Um, and perhaps there's an element of her in everybody. Perhaps there's an element of Joy, George Floyd um, in some of the black people that could be abused by police. Uh, so I think there's so much to learn from a play like this for responsibility right now for young people and older people. Everyone in society can really appreciate the theme of social justice and responsibility from Priestley's play. Now, Penny has dropped. Haha. <laughs> Let's go back in time and take a little look at the life of J.B. Priestley. An English novelist, playwright, screenwriter, broadcaster and social commentator, Priestley was born in Bradford. His Yorkshire background is reflected in much of his fiction. His father, Jonathan Priestley, was a headmaster that he respected in his local school. Emma Priestley, his mother, died when he was very young and his father remarried later. In 1964, Priestley published an extended essay called Man in Time, which was interested in something called precognitive dreaming, which relates to precognition and the psychic ability to see, see events in the future before they happen. This reminds me a lot of Inspector Ghoul in An Inspector Calls. Uh, in the First World War, Priestley served as a lance corporal. He was badly wounded in 1916, when he was buried alive by a trench mortar and he spent a great deal of time after convalescing in military hospitals much like Wilfred Owen. Okay now there are many different forms of production of an inspector calls radio television movie obviously the original script the book which I recommend you read as well on the left you can see the BBC 2015 86 minute film directed by the female Eileen Walsh, and that is, I think, a terrific version, very true to the original intention um, of J.B. Priestley. In the middle, you have the Hong Kong 2015 uh, movie, same length, 86 minutes, directed by Pak Ming Wong and Herman Yao, very, very different. So lots of slapstick, uh, satirical, making fun. It's dark because it's representing a murder in a funny way. Uh, the chap there sitting on the table with the medallion playing Arthur Burling is hilarious. Um, I recommend you watch that. It's, it's interesting if you watch it in tandem with the other versions. On the right hand side we have Stephen Daldry's production. What he does uh, is he substitutes the, the Burling's Edwardian uh, dining room table for, for this doll's house uh, perched precariously in a desolate post-blitz landscape according to The Guardian. So he's really changing the context slightly, bringing in, for example, at the start of the play, a boy who's wandering aimlessly in this sort of uh, wartime situation, trying to arouse different sentiments there. So I think if you want to understand a play, it's important that you see it from many different angles. And by doing that, you're gonna gain a deeper appreciation of whatever uh, the writer is trying to convey. In conclusion, I want to leave you with some wise words from the play. This is from Act 3, uh, Inspector Ghoul's final warning. He says to the Burling family, Just remember this. One Eva Smith has gone, but there are millions and millions and millions of Eva Smiths and John Smiths still left with us, with their lives, with their hopes and fears, their suffering and chance of happiness, all intertwined with our lives and what we think and say and do. We don't live alone. We are members of one body. We are responsible for each other. And I tell you that the time will come soon when if men will not learn that lesson, then they will be taught it in fire and blood and anguish. Good night. Before I leave you, I just want to say that this is a message which, you know, can apply to many things in life. Just think now of, of the Black Lives Matter movement, for example. 
So I think this is a powerful play and a powerful story that we should share with others. And I hope that you have enjoyed listening to this. And if you have, uh, please leave a comment. And thank you for watching. These are my sources. I've used the British Library, Wikipedia, BBC, Radio Times, Oxford Playhouse, Pixabay for free images, The Thought Company, J.B. Priestley Society, and a Guardian article. I put this picture of the geese in the background to say that J.B. Priestley's message may be also useful in thinking about in relation to climate change, for example. We can all make a difference no matter how small. Thank you for watching.